Well, my final guest today is part of Cheltenham Festival folklore because it was he who won the champion hurdle three times on See You Then, cruelly nicknamed by the racing media See You When, as he would hardly ever hit a race course, but he was a testament to the brilliant training of Nicky Henderson, who nursed him to the Cheltenham Festival each year to victory. Uh, Steve Smith Eccles had an amazing career. He had over 5,000 rides and a great strike race at that time as well of over 800 winners. Not only that, his career spanned an extraordinary length of time for a jockey at that time, beginning in 1974 and not ending until 1993. He famously said that the game had given him up, not the other way around, and but for that he'd probably still be riding today at a very youthful 66. Steve Smith Eccles, welcome to the show. Cheers, Nick. How are you? You've had some life. I have. I've been very, very lucky in the respect that I rode some very nice horses for some very nice people. And see you then, of course, will always be the horse that defines you, really. Do you think every rider, when they come to the end of their career, needs a horse like that? Or is it, does it become a burden as you go on through your career? Certainly not a burden. I mean, it's a, an honour and a privilege to ride horses like that. Um, I had one before him that I, I really did enjoy riding. Uh, Tingle Creek. Tingle Creek, yeah. the legendary Tingle Creek, ex-American, yeah. and that was part of, part of your time riding a lot for, for Tom Jones. That's it. I was apprentice to Tom Jones uh, for five years, took over as first jockey uh, two years after my apprenticeship finished. Uh, Ian Watkinson was riding for him. Prior to that was uh, uh, David Mould. And I must give David Mould a mention because schooling with him, he seemed to take me under his wing. He, he, we, we got on so great together, he taught me all I know. And David Moll was a fantastic jockey, as people in those, those days can uh, uh, remember. You, your career sort of spans two quite distinct generations of jockeys as well. The fact that you were starting with people like David yeah. Mould yeah. and Jeff King, and David Nicholson would still have been He was still riding, riding yeah. When, yeah. When, when you started. Yeah. Do you look back on that and think, that seems an eternity ago, those names? <laughs> Yes, um, it's, it's, it's funny, I mean, I, I don't feel that old. I'm, you don't I, look it. Well, whatever. But I mean, mentally, I'm, I'm still virtually riding in my riding days. That's how I look at life. When I wake up in the morning, what am I going to do today? I've always got to do something. And, uh, okay, I've had to mellow a little bit and slow down, but uh, I still enjoy life to the full. So what was it like riding with those guys then? Those guys who were still kind of 19, what you would call 1960s jockeys? Yeah. Well, it was a privilege to ride with them. I mean, it was tough in those days. And uh, if you stepped out of line, you'd get stamped on straight away. So you had to behave yourself. But the one thing they did do, they taught you. They all, for whatever reason, as I said about David Mould, Jeff King, they all took me under their wing when I first started. And I don't, I don't know why that happened, but it, it was great for me. And I, I rose through the ranks so quickly. It, 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 it's, it's, it's like a dream. I th well, I think back to Steve St. Eccles, the jockey, it's like a dream. Because you, you came from a coal mining family, didn't you? Born and bred in a coal mining family in uh, Derbyshire. Uh, when you reach the age of 14, like my dad, he got sent down the mine. There's no ifs, no buts. He was down there with his father and uh, all his brothers and whatever. And dad took me down there one day on a Sunday. I was about 12 years of age. And he took me down to pit bottom. And the most scary thing in my life was going down in this cage from the, the top to the pit bottom. And it went down like an exocet missile. And it was unbelievable. And dad did this every day. And he, all he did was take me down to the pit bomb, showed me around where everybody congregated and then moved off to uh, the coal face. And it could be a mile underground, two, uh, two miles underground and three miles to where the coal face is. And they used to have to walk and crawl and he'd be on his hands and knees hacking out coal. Uh, that was enough to make you think I... That, well, he did that deliberately. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't want me to go down the mine, which thank God I didn't. Uh, I was lucky to pass me 11 plus, so I went to grammar school, I was grammar school educated, and I didn't sit my O-levels because I left before the O-levels came up. Mum and Dad wrote off to uh, three different trainers to get me into racing. One was Arthur Stevenson, cock of the north. The other one was uh, Frenchy Nicholson. Mm -hmm. He didn't take kids under uh, seven stone. He, no, he, all his kids needed to be under seven stone. And the third was Harry Thompson-Jones, and he took me on a month's trial. 
and that was the first horse I ever saw when I went into Tom Jones's yard, age 15. Prior to that, the only thing I'd ever sat on was a donkey on Skegness Beat and a pit pony when they came up from uh, the, the mines in the summer. So was it you or your parents who wanted you to go into racing? What was the, what was the impetus? Uh, uh, Dad and my uncle, they used to watch racing every Saturday afternoon, black and white, on TV. I used to walk by the sofa and say, I'm going to be a jockey when I grow up, Dad. Carry on walking. And all the way through my grammar school uh, schooling, uh, the careers officer used to say, uh, Smith Eggles, what, you, what, what, what do you fancy doing? I'm going to be a jockey. And that flunks them. And that was it. And presumably... It, it, it's, you... it's crazy, but that's... Yeah, the top of the top you, bottom. You, you passed your eleven plus. You were saying you were at grammar school. You're good school. Yeah, you're clearly pretty bright. Yeah, but you were totally tunnel vision. Yeah, I'm wanting to be a jockey. Crazy. Okay, so when you first sat on a racehorse at Thompson Jones's, yeah, what did it feel like? Did it feel like the most natural thing to you? Not in the no, uh, nowhere near it. Um, the first horse I sat on was a horse called Battalonius. He was the old act, and we had to trot him round the sand ring. I couldn't bump <laughs> saddle. For the first three days, I had the sorest backside in Newmarket. And then something clicked. And then we went out on the heath, following the string, and moved up a, a notch onto a, an old horse that uh, still racing. Uh, and then within three months, I rode a gallop with a, ho a guy called Lester Pickett. How was that? Unbelievable. But I mean, th I think anybody can learn to ride to a certain standard. But it's what happens then. And for me, having taught uh, kids jo as a jockey coach, you can teach every everybody to ride to a certain standard, but the ones that are going to make it mm -hmm. have that inner... It's, a, it's an essence in there, and it's got to be brought out. And if it's there, you can bring it out. If it's not there, you can give them any amount of practice, but that's as good as you're going to be what you see there. So who brought out your essence? Good question. There was no uh, jockey coaching around in those days. Uh, I just watched other people. Uh, there was one old boy in the stable, uh, Christy. Um, an old boy, an old Irish boy. He took me under his wing and he learnt me the basics and whatever. But I, I just watched. Stan Mello was first jockey. Used to come down and do the schooling or whatever. I wasn't schooling at the time, but I used to watch him and asking questions on the way back uh, uh, back to the stables and whatever. Now there's a man who, whenever I have anybody in that chair who has seen Stan Meller riding a horse, they, they sort of get all hushed and say, this was something to behold. Yeah, he was the first man to ride 1,000 winners. What was so good about him? On a horse called Uzo, for Tom Jones. Mm. Um, I don't know, he's, he's just a natural. He's just a genius. Horses ran for him. Didn't have any weight problems or anything like that. And everything he rode, he gave a ride to. Unbelievable. So would you have modelled yourself a little bit on? Uh, a little bit, a little bit, but more, more so David Mould. Mm. Because I never schooled with Stan. I schooled with David. And he was a fantastic uh, jockey, David. Lovely pair of hands. Cool as a cucumber. Now, you don't strike me as someone who was ever short of self-belief during your, during your career. Yeah. Uh, when you started riding in races, did you think, yeah, I belong here? Or did it take a while? Well, funny enough, the first ride I ever had over, uh, over hurdles was at uh, Huntingdon. And it was uh, for a permit trainer out in the, uh, out in the fence. And uh, he'd ran a couple of times. And uh, Jimmy Scallon was due to ride it. But he, he, got to, he, he worked at Tom Jones's with us. He rode one for Tom, Tempered Steel. And he gave me the leg up on this, uh, this horse. And this is no word of a lie. We're going at the first hurdle. The horse screws in midair. And all of a sudden, I find myself with two feet on one side of the saddle. Just about to fall off. When the guy on the inside pushed me back in the saddle. Right, OK. <laughs> right. So we go round. Uh, we come up to the uh, last hurdle. And this is no way to lie, coming to the last hurdle, we're out the back, there's a guy in front of me, and about three or four lengths, either, uh, this side of him, for the rail. So I'm, I'm going to come up the rail. So as I come up the rail, going to the last hurdle, this guy slams me against the, the rail. 
don't you dare stick up my inside, he said. <laughs> and it was the same guy uh, uh. that pushed me back in the saddle at the first hurdle. <laughs> so it helped you up to a point. Yes. But don't take the mickey. Exactly. So you then realised that you kind of yeah. knew you had to work your way up the pecking order. Yes. By what point had you become Steve Smith Eccles, you know? I think uh, it had to be about 17, 18. Uh, I had three rides one season when I was about 17. The following year, I had about 20 odd rides. And I rode about 10 winners. Which, I mean, my yeah. average was phenomenal all the way through my career. And it was then when Ian Watkinson decided to go to Peter Bailey. Mm -hmm. He was going to get pushed from Tom, but he stepped out of it before he did. And I got the job. And I, I'd, I'd only ridden. I was just losing my claim. Because, I mean, in those days, I think you only had to ride about 25, 30 winners to lose your claim. So I was just losing my claim. And Tom says, there you are, sir, all yours. And then before you know it, you're 21 years of age and you're riding Tingle Creek. And the first time I rode Tingle Creek at Sandown, it was in the latter stages of, of his career, he broke the track record as a, I think it was a nine-year-old, 10-year-old. Wow. A year later, in the, uh, in the same race, which is now the Tingle Creek Chase, he was, that was his retirement race, he went out and broke his own track record. Amazing. That's it. I mean, to, to be that young, to ride such a horse like that, unbelievable. It sets the bar pretty high, doesn't it? Yeah. And then Tom, was tra Tom actually discovered uh, Sheikh Mohammed. So he had he all Sheikh Mohammed's horses. He was still training jumpers. And then all of a sudden he realised this is a go the goose that lays the golden egg here. So he got rid of his jumpers. And as luck would have it, Nicky had just started training in Lambourne. Uh, Bob... Uh, Davis was his first jockey for his first year and with Tom getting rid of all his jumpers one of them was a horse called Zonglero mm. that got sent to Nicky right on the provisio that Smith Eggles rode it so that's how, what got me Nikki, my foot how did Nicky Henderson feel about that I think I think he was all right I think he was all right yeah, yeah. Uh, but then I rode Zonglero, and he, he was second in the NSC, second in the magazine. He was always second. But he, you know, he, he, in, in saying that, they were always top-class racers. And, as I say, that got me the foot in the door with Nick. Bob was coming to the end of his career, so I took over as first jockey. So we all know Nicky Henderson, you know, now or in the yeah. last sort of 20, 20, 25 years. What was he like then as a young man, as a sort of young, thrusting trainer? Did you always think, yeah, this guy's going places? Yeah, but he, Iper, he, he was, it's, it's hard to explain. I mean, he, he left no stone unturned when it came to training horses and giving you orders and stuff like that. The analysis that you went through after the races and whatever. He was, he, he, he was tailor-made for training horses, Nicky Anderson. And that's why he's such a genius that he is. Because he puts heart and soul into it. Was and I, I know that from going all that far back with him. Was he? It strikes me from what you're saying, he was kind of ahead of his time. He was just a bit different to all the people who were around at that time. Yeah, yeah. And he, he had obviously had a, an eye for a horse and whatever. But, I mean, a typical example of uh, the trainer he was, uh, the second year that see you then won the champion hurdle, we had a real bad winter. And uh, Nicky, he wasn't... Uh, he was in... Uh, Windsor House, it's the first yard he trained mm. from. And opposite the, uh, the yard was a little sand track. And uh, only about a furlong and a half round. And during that build up to that second champion hurdle, we had a real bad winter. And Nicky used to get up at three o'clock in the morning, get on the tractor with a roller, and roll this track. So, see you then, could hack round in the morning. And he did that day in and day out. So it was just 100% yeah. care yes. and attention to getting that horse yeah. to the... and he could quite easily have given it to one of the lads or whatever, but he did it himself. Amazing. You weren't even supposed to ride see you then? No. I was first jockey. I got my retainer. Uh, but when Nicky got this horse sent him, and I... Uh, uh, an Italian, he was an Italian count that owned it. He wanted Frankham, 
Franken was the best. He, he, he wanted Franken, we'll see you then. So I'm, I'm riding 40, 50 of the other horses. So I sort of one, let one slip through, I don't mind. Anyway, uh, the build up to the champion hurdle, Franken had rode him in his prep race and whatever. Come champion hurdle day, back in 1985, uh, you had the supreme novices, mm -hmm. Second race was the Arkle, then the champion hurdle. Yeah. Frankham rode the reject in the Arkle for Fred Winter. And he fell. And as he fell, as the horse got up, his leg went up and he was hung up. Luckily, the fence attendant ran over and caught the horse. Now, very, very rarely do you ever see any jockeys get hung up. Yeah. Frankham got hung up on the reject. Now, he wasn't physically injured or anything like that, but he was shook up, as you can appreciate. Now, see then was a 14 to 1, 16 to 1 shot in that first race. And I think if he'd have been 5 to 4 favourite, Franklin would have ridden him. Anyway, he cried off. So I got the race uh, to ride in the race 10 minutes before it was due. due off. I mean, you, you knew the horse, obviously, from, I'd from, him from home. home. Yeah. Yeah. Did you think he was any good? Oh, God, yeah. Did was, you think he was, was good he, enough to win this? Yes. Well, no, I didn't, if I'm honest. I thought he might get placed. But he was bred to win derbies. His, his breeding was fantastic. He, he was flat race bred. And I, I'd only schooled him once, so I, I didn't really know the horse. But as you can see here, he travelled so well. And I, all I did know, I can't hit the front until after the last. I just bided my time, and the one thing he did, more than anything else, was jump. In all the, I didn't ride him many times because he didn't run many times. He never made a mistake. He always put himself right two or three strides before the hurdle. I mean, look at this. This is just imperious. Well, yeah. yeah. So that was his first. That was his first champion. Champion hurdle. Yeah. And that was it. Then he was your ride. Owner yes. was like, well, yeah, now, now the, quite like Steve Heckles now. No, the, 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 the other side of the story is Frankham. So he gets hung up on the reject. Mm. Very rarely does that happen. Three weeks later, he rides the reject at Chepstow. It fell. He got hung up again. That's right. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Frankham came in, he said, somebody's trying to tell me something, threw his saddle on the table and he said, that's me done. And he walked out there and then, never rode again. Um, I wanted to ask about, about John because he's been such a close oh. friend of yours and was such a close colleague when you were riding. Yeah. Uh, you've been riding since 74 and yeah. this was 85. So yeah. it's 11 years really together, growing yeah. up together, being yeah. successful together. Yeah, he was the best man at my wedding. Exactly. Um, when he did that, for that, when he did that, oh, I might come to that in a minute, but when he, <laughs> when he, when he chucked the saddle on the table, I, what were you thinking? Well, how did that make you feel? Yeah, I was shocked. Because, I mean, but, um, Frank was always different from everybody else. He, he's an extraordinary character. He, he's not the norm. He's eccentric in certain ways and whatever. And it, it didn't surprise me when he did it. I wasn't really expecting it, but it didn't surprise, it didn't surprise me. But th did it feel weird without him? Of course he did. I sat next to him for 15 years while we were riding. He always had the top spot. I was second in command. Yeah. Really odd. And is that kind of the way you you like the dynamic? How did you feel sliding into, into well, seniority? Yeah, I mean, yeah the, the next year uh, I was odds on favourite to win the championship, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but uh, Skew came along with uh, Martin Pipe. So, and it, it was I, I, I was I was runner up a couple of times. I was never champion jockey, but everybody expected me to be champion jockey when Frank, I always call him Frank, when Frank retired. Does it still gnaw away at you a little bit? He does a little bit because I'm sure I could have done a little bit more than I did. But I, I used to wake up in the morning and think, today's another day, and I lived from day to day. I never really planned anything. And if, if, I, if I could change things in my life, I would have planned a lot, to, a lot more. But isn't that, the, isn't that the secret to 
feeling so vital and feeling so youthful that you're never thinking too far ahead, you're never trying to be too strategic about it. Exactly. You live every day as though it's your last. And doing that job, bearing in mind a, a fractured vertebra in my neck and vertebra in my back, it could quite easily have been. But you, it, you, was, you was only that far away from a fall, you see. But it was the, it's the length of your career, as I said at the beginning of the interview, that amazed me, it's particularly at, at that time yeah. when you know, people weren't so preoccupied with their own health, their own safety. Races weren't as safe then. Um, to, you must have loved it so much. I did. I did. And that's why I shed a tear when I actually retired from race riding myself. And you said that the game gave you up rather than you giving it up. Do you still think like that? Even though you were, you know, yeah, you were 39 odd or whatever, it wasn't as though you I was 39 pushing 40. Yeah. And if you made 40 in them days, you'd have done bloody well. But um, I just, I, I woke up one day and uh, I had one ride for James Fanshawe, odds on favourite down at Windsor. And I'm driving down at Windsor, I was on my own. And for what I thought to myself, I'm not really enjoying this. Anyway. Rolled the horse, he got beat. I was on favour, finished fourth. I came in to the weighing room, threw my saddle on the table and said, that's me done, boys. And that was it, just walked away. There was no planning of it, like, like most jockeys like to go out and a winner and stuff like that. It just came on me, just like that, one day driving down to Windsor. I could still ride. My bottle was still there and I still had plenty of horses to ride, but not as good as my heyday. And that's why I say, the racing gave me up. I wasn't commanding the rides that I had in my heyday. Mm. And I wasn't getting the good rides. So it was time to move on. And as I say, if you're making 40, you've done well in that game. And I was still in one piece. And, and I had other things to do. I went into TV and all sorts of stuff. Did you enjoy that? I did. It was hard work. Um, what was it? The, the racing channel when yep. it first yep. started. Um, I got taken on board. I can't remember the name of the, uh, the boss man. George Irvin? No. Mick Hambleton? It, no, it was George. George Irvin, yeah. Yeah, George. I got on really well with him. But um, and he, I, used to, I used to turn up at, say, uh, Yarmouth race course or fake number, hunting or whatever, and it'd be me and my microphone and a cameraman. Mm. That's, that's what it was like in those days. It still is. <laughs> I don't like to tell you, but... Really? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah, and I, was a bit different. I, I loved yeah. it, and I, I did that for about five years, and you know, I then moved on to other things. And uh, so, when I mean, when you did retire and you had other things to do, yeah, could anything really replicate it though? I know you won't. No, be, no. nothing can ever replicate, replicate being a jump jockey and riding good horses like that. Your Tingle Creeks, you see your Thens, and all the others that went with them. And the fact that you were you were living it and you were having fun doing it, yeah. And you were quite unapologetic about that at the time as well, Very weren't much you? So. You were like, yeah, if I want to go be a playboy, I'll be a yeah. playboy. Yeah, yeah. Didn't leave anything behind. Certainly not. Um, it it didn't really get you into a spot of bother the the time when when you fell asleep in the back of a car, didn't it? <laughs> yes, it's a story I'm not proud of, but uh, it's, it's a good one though. It does put a smile on people's face, so I, I assume you want me to relate the story. Uh, listen, you're going to tell it much better than me. <laughs> yeah, it all began at Cheltenham. Believe it or believe it not, I, uh, I won the Supreme Novices Hurdle on uh, a horse called River Carrion. Mm -hmm. Nicky Henderson. Yeah, Nicky. And I had a good Cheltenham. And uh, River Carrion and another couple of horses ran on the first day of the, uh, I think it was the 1986 Grand National, mm -hmm. uh, Grand National Week, and they got stuffed. And talk about bloody distraught. I mean, if you win a, a triumph, uh, a Supreme Novices by 10, 12 lengths, you go to Liverpool, you expect to win again. And I, I think I finished about third or fourth. Anyway, the lady I was with at the time, yeah, was Tom Jones's daughter, yeah, who had married. Uh, John Hain, Johnny Hain. Yeah. So Di Hain was her name. We'd been together for uh, about a year and she just started training. So we go up to uh, Liverpool for the three days. We're staying at the, uh, the Royal Hotel at, in Southport. So I've had a bad day at the office, okay? Coming back from the track to the hotel, she informs me that we have to go out with these for dinner with these 
people, these new owners and whatever, and I'd met them before, met them before, and it was boring farts, to say the least. <laughs> and I was in a, a real bad mood, to say the least, having got, got beat on River Kerryog. And uh, I'd only got the one ride the following day, the Friday, which I had no chance of winning. So I said, look, I'm sorry, but I've organised to go out with the uh, Irish jocks. Tommy mm -hmm. McGinn, Rover, all the Irish come over. And I was going to have a night out with them in, uh, in Liverpool. So a blazing row ensued. Mm -hmm. And the upshot was that if I didn't come back and stay in the hotel, uh, that was it. Game uh, over. Game over. So... You can't have women dictate to you like that, can you? So with that, I go down to the bar. I find out, just round the corner from Southport, uh, uh, in Southport, Ginger McCain, mm -hmm. the trains. Literally, just round the corner, walking distance from the hotel. So I thought, he's throwing a party. So I thought, I'll compromise. I won't go all the way into Liverpool. I'll go around to Ginger's. So I went around to Ginger's, had a skin full of whiskey, came back to the hotel, knocked on the door and politely got told to sling me up. So what do you do? It's two o'clock in the morning, got nowhere to stay. I thought, right, OK. Got a brand new Mick, Mercedes outside. I'll sleep in the back seat of there. I've slept in worse places than that. So get in the back seat, cold night, get me overcoat, my riding jackets, and I'm snug as a bug as a rug in the back seat, <laughs> fast asleep. So what could only have been about 40 minutes, 50 minutes later, I come to a state of consciousness and I'm thinking, where am I? I'm in the back seat of my car. Fuck me, it's moving. <laughs> I had to tell that, I, I have to tell, that's exactly as you can imagine. With that, I popped up from underneath all these jackets and coats and there's a kid, he couldn't have been any more than 16, 17. He's driving my brand new Mirk at 90 miles an hour down the M62. Now, if you think I had a shock, you should have seen him. He squealed like a stuck pig, rammed it on the hard shoulder and legged it over these fields. <laughs> so what, what do you do? So I thought, all right, drive down to the next junction, I get me bearing, I go back to the hotel, I park it in the same spot where he nicked it from, okay made sure I took the keys out and locked the door this time. Woke up the oh, next dear. morning. Luckily, Di let me get me clothes, so I got all the clothes out of my hotel room, and I go racing. Now, as I say, I've only, I've only got the one ride. It's no good, so I've got to go. Uh, I'm not too worried. And all of a sudden, I think, did this, did this happen? Well, yeah, he did, obviously. And I had to tell somebody. So I told Johnny Buckingham, my valet. Valet, yeah. Before you know it, he's told this person, that person, or whatever. <laughs> Before you know it, I'm on BBC One telling Desmond Lynham this story. And my track record in the Grand National was very poor. I'd, did I'd, you did you drop the F-bomb with Des as well and he have to apologise to everyone like I've had, I'm, I'm going to have to? I think I did, actually. Yeah, yeah I thought so. Because <laughs> that's you've got to tell the story because that's exactly what happened. How you felt, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm thinking to myself, I'm in big trouble here. So I rode my I rode my horse on that day. Don't remember what it was, and I go and stay with John and Miriam, Frankham. Yeah. They've got a little hotel on the on the Wirral. So I'm feeling a bit sheepish, as you can imagine. So I have a early night, and uh, as I say, my track record in the Grand National wasn't very good. And all of a sudden, I realise on Saturday morning, uh, my career's on the on the line. But prior to that, I'm down in I'm down in the breakfast room, and I I never had any weight problems or anything like that. So I'm tucking into me bacon and egg and whatever, and I'm looking around the room, and everybody's reading the the newspaper, <laughs> and you you got the front page staring at you. So I'm looking I'm looking around the room, and jump jockey kidnap. Jockey taken for a ride? Who the <laughs> hell's that? And all of a sudden I see a picture, it's my face on the front page. So you of were virtually every yeah. daily tabloid. You were the most famous man in the country. Yeah. And that, then I'm at the races. I mean, I've got three rides. Luckily, Cathy's lad wins the first race, two mile handicap. See so who then actually ran over two and a half miles, didn't get a yard over two miles, finished mm. second behind uh, Enoch or something like that. Yep. And the Grand National ride that I had that year was classified for Nicky Anderson and Cheveley Park. 
He saved my life. Okay, uh, West Tip won it, but I finished third. He ran a blind. He ran way, way, way above all expectations. And he saved my career that, that day. And it was a career that, that went on and, and on and, and to, mm. to so now, much success as well. I'm not proud of that well. story. But it's a good one. But it's, I can tell it now. I don't think you've got too much to, to worry about. Well, and there you go. It's been, as I say, it's been a great career and a great life, and I'm very grateful for, for, for you, to you for sharing it with us. It's not just about Tingle Creek and, and See You Then either. It was, it's quite a nice link, really, that you and Michael Buckley have, not just the link with Nicky Henderson, both, both Colonial Cup winners as well. And, yeah, um, yeah. That was the, uh, the most prize money I've ever won, the Colonial Cup. Yeah. And the worst thing about that, I didn't stay and party. I rode at Windsor on Saturday afternoon, <laughs> flew out to America, rode on Sunday afternoon at, in Camden, South Carolina, and flew back then through the night to ride at Leicester on a Monday. I that, should have stayed and partied. That will be, that will be your epitaph. Steve Smith Eccles, I should have stayed and partied. I'm grateful for you <laughs> staying and partying with us. Enjoy Cheltenham. We'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks for watching.